In this episode of Stonks on Rails, I'm going to be adding the ability to save images along with my notes so that I can see the charts at the time that I made the note. This is a feature that was in my previous version of the program, which I'm now refactoring to clean up some technical debt. Unlike my other videos, I'm going to be winging this one a lot more by narrating it as I go along writing the code. I don't really have as much of a plan for this one as I did for my other videos, so we'll see what surprises come up. Let's get started. So here's the original screen that I'm trying to port into the new version of my system. I know it seems a little bit silly that I'm replicating the original interface verbatim almost, but keep in mind that this is going to be a major refactor of the code behind the scenes. I'm eliminating the messy jQuery structure that I have and replacing it with an entirely new underlying code structure using Rails Hotwire and Stimulus controllers. So the screenshot feature that I'm going to be adding back today is what allows me to take a picture of whatever stop chart it is that I'm working on or, or that I'm looking at while I'm taking my note. And this allows me to better retrospectively go back at what I recorded back at the time I was thinking about it and reanalyze my thought process so that I could make better trades going into the future. So when I initially made this program, it was running on my Mac. And to take the screenshot, the facility I was using was the screen capture command line utility that's available on the Mac. Uh, I go ahead and run that command, and then it would take the screenshot to the, to the specifications that I needed. And then I would be using Image Magic to do some conversions on that to resize for a thumbnail. So what I'm going to have to do today is I'm going to have to take the data from my Mac, move it over to my Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, so that I could look at the screenshots and that they'll load and everything properly. But then I'm going to have to adapt this interactor so that it works with the WSL and Windows. And I actually did a, a video on this a few months back where I did some experiments trying to take screenshots using the command line in Windows. And that's going to allow me to bring this feature over to the upgraded system. So here I want to point out that whenever I take a screenshot, uh, what it's doing is it's saving the screenshot to this uh, local directory here under full size, and then it creates a thumbnail under the thumbnails directory. I have that set as a program constant. So I actually made this program a while back, and I wouldn't do it this way. I wouldn't have a constants file. What I'd rather do now is set environment variables so that it's a bit more configurable. But that's okay, we, we can work with this. The thing that I kind of question, whether it's a best practice or not, is placing it into the public directory of the repository. And this is probably one of the reasons I would want to make this configurable. By default, the way that the real server works is that if none of the routes match for a given URL, the last place that the router is going to look for something to deliver is in the public directory. And everything in the public directory is served as a static file. So if somebody submits an HTTP request for the path of local note taker, screenshots, slash full size, slash the name of the image file, the Rails router is going to look here in this directory and deliver the file. Now in a high throughput production environment, you probably don't want to occupy your server bandwidth delivering files that can be somewhat large, like images. Also, the image files could add up quickly in size, and then there's the issue of space on the server where you're running your Rails application. For a site with a lot of users, you probably want to store the images somewhere where storage space can be scalable. For that reason, it's probably best to serve image assets through a specialized media delivery system like Amazon S3, or a CDN, Content Delivery Network, or another specialized server where the bandwidth costs are lower. But I think in this case, because this is like just my local hobby program, I'm okay just storing these files into the public directory of, uh, of wherever the website's running, which is going to be on my local system because I have to take the screenshots on my local system. So, you know, this is a very specialized app. 
it's okay to do it this way because it's tailoring to a specific sort of needs, but I would definitely do it differently if we were doing it in a more commercialized production system at scale with, with many users. So naturally the first step that I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy all of those image assets from my MacBook and put them onto my Windows subsystem for Linux instance which is a Debian instance here and that way I'll be able to access the stonk notes images inside of my new application the refactored one and I don't want this being committed to the repository in git so I'm going to add it to the git ignore the next task to do is taking this display template written in Haml from the old version of the program and transpose it into slim in the new version of the program I'm going to be speeding up some of this boring thinking out loud sort of coding but if you want to see the finished code in its entirety don't forget that I post this on GitHub, so check out that link in the video description. Now, you'll probably notice that when I'm doing CSS, I take a trial and error approach to it. Sometimes I'll add temporary borders so that you can see normally invisible spaces on the page layouts. Seeing those borders makes it a little bit easier to position things. Another thing I've been incorporating in my CSS lately is the BEM naming convention. And basically, it just means that I use a double underscore to denote CSS that's associated with a larger block of CSS and HTML. So, for example, I have this stonk note show uh, piece of CSS, which denotes uh, a stonk note. And associated with that, within that block of HTML, I have special styling for the timestamp and actions. And all these work together to make that particular component on the page. Now the double dash is used to represent variations of different things that could occur within a block. So for example here I'm changing the background color of a particular stonk note to show how I'm labeling it when I'm reviewing my trades later and I want to show like green, a greenish color to denote my good calls and, uh, and a different color to show calls that were actually bad. All right, so I finally got this code working. The historical images are loading and displaying all right. And if I click on one of those images, it gives me a nice big view of the image in a new browser tab. Now I'm going to work on the functionality to add a new stonk note to the page, along with the image file that I want to capture for the screenshot of the chart that I'm looking at. And the first step to doing this is I'm going to add an action to the stimulus controller that will trigger some JavaScript code that runs a request when I trigger that action by clicking the new note button. So there I'm adding a new action with just a test message and I'm wiring that up to the button in the view template. So now when I go back to the page and click the button, I should see that the action is being triggered and there it goes in the console. Now let's take a look at some of the legacy code that I want to update. So in this old program, uh, what I used was CoffeeScript and I would do Ajax requests and I have some messy jQuery here. As you can see here, I've got multiple files. I got files for different functions and uh, I just included these in the rendering templates it really isn't the best way of doing these things, but I mean, it worked for jQuery days, but it's great now that we have stimulus because that gives us a much better structure for organizing our front end code rather than this messy way of just kind of commingling it with the templates. So some of this I could definitely copy and paste with, with a little bit of modification, of course. But the same workflow is gonna be the same. Now here we've got an interesting issue with how do we make a request in Turbo.js or Stimulus.js in the Hotwire framework. I have an interesting little dilemma here in that I don't know what the Hotwire best practice is for doing what I would have normally used Ajax for. Ajax is a way that you can make an asynchronous request in JavaScript. Seven to ten years ago when I built this program the jQuery library gave you tools to help out with that. 
But since then, the JavaScript language itself has incorporated better native support for doing AJAX, so you no longer really need jQuery. So now I'm questioning, should I use that functionality that's built into the JavaScript, or does Hotware give us a better alternative to AJAX now? Okay, so something that I find kind of difficult about Turbo right now is the lack of good examples for documentation. So when I'm trying to read some of the um, some of the best practices, I, I don't think they're very well established. For example, when I look on the forum, I mean, a lot of people they're you know they're they're not sure of the best way of doing things. There's a lot of oh you could do that, you know may, maybe you could solve this problem this way, but there does it, it's so undefined right now that it seems to be so, somewhat unclear on what they want you to do. In other words, it's not as well defined as Rails is. Rails is very opinionated. They kind of show you how to do most of the common things that you'd want to do in Rails, but I don't think the opinions on using Turbo and stimulus are very well formed at this moment. So after looking at this problem and thinking about what's available, I'm starting to think that maybe instead of using an AJAX request like I did in the previous system, um, AJAX is very, it works really well with jQuery and that's kind of the old way of doing things. I think what might work better here is making a hidden form and populating that hidden form and then triggering the action through Turbo and let Turbo handle the link between sending the information and back. That might be the more hotwire way of doing things. So the first thing that I'm going to do right now is I'm going to create a new form for adding a new stock note. And it's going to be a really simple form just consisting of one field and a submit button. So the way that my program's designed, whenever I'm creating a new note, all I need is the message and everything else gets dynamically created on the stock note object. And this means that all I'm going to need for the input form to make a new stock note is just one field for the message. I'm actually just working on the proof of concept workflow here, just trying to figure out the best way of handling that interaction between the back end and the front end. So I'm not going to worry at all for now about the logic that validates the stonk note and does all that post-processing to build the metadata. I'm actually going to just fake it in the controller and return something that will get appended to the list of items that we see in the front end. Basically, I'm just trying to figure out how well Turbo can replace the AJAX calls that are typically managed by front-end JavaScript. I also want to point out that a convention that I like to follow for my programs is that I only render one variable as an instance variable in my controller, and I tend to always name it result. And the reason I do this is just to keep things simple. I've seen other programs where there are a whole bunch of different variables rendered that end up in the view template, and that could end up becoming very difficult to keep track of over time. So what I like to do is I like just having one variable to deal with, and sometimes I could add a more complicated data structure to that if the situation calls for it, but most of the time it does not, so I kind of stick with one variable for rendering. So here I'm going to edit out a lot of the boilerplate code that I'm writing for this part. If you want to see the finished product, check out the GitHub link in the video description. So now I'm going to skip to the part where I've got my form set up and I'm trying to test it here, but I'm having some issues with that request having a problem on the Rails end of things. And something that I'm going to have to address later is how Turbo recovers from errors, which is something I haven't quite figured out yet because when it has that 500 request, the end user at this point doesn't really see exactly why the request failed because of the format that the error is returned. So this is what happens when you have an error on the back end. Very messy error message. So that's another topic that I need to look into is how do you recover from an error using turbo streams? I need to figure out a way to capture this data and display it to the user with a meaningful error message. 
because right now it's just rendering the standard 500 internal server error message that Rails generates. This is the development mode type of message. And that doesn't really have anything that's useful for the user to know that there was a problem or be able to report anything meaningful. So I need to figure out how to get Rails or Turbo to recognize that and say that there was some type of 500 error. At least the user would have something in that case rather than something that's unprocessable by the front end JavaScript. So I'm going to ignore that 500 error message handling for now and I'm going to just keep working at it and cleaning up the controller so that it gets a positive response. And I finally got to the point where it's rendering the turbo stream as expected. Okay, as you can see here, it rendered the turbo stream because we're working with a frame. But in this case, I didn't really want it to render a turbo stream. I wanted it to re render an HTML. So how do we do that? So this presents a little interesting dilemma here. It seems like when you're using Turbo and you submit a form, it'll automatically use the MIME type of Turbo Stream. So if I'm arranged for processing that, I can't really process another type of MIME type. Like for example, with this request here, what would this be? Would this be a GET request? I'm not really sure. So never mind. The way that I could fix this is by making adjustments to this form, this new template, including a place for the rendered item to show up here if we just happen to be on that page. But no, maybe I don't want to do that because I want to lazy load this from the other thing. So this form is going to be very difficult to use in a standalone situation. Let's go ahead and just try to incorporate this form inside the larger stock notes content and we'll see what happens. And there you go. The uh, test message the test messages that we're trying to create are showing up in there displaying in the front end. Well, there's a lot more work to do here. I think I'm going to wrap up this video for now because I think this is a good stopping point. Next, I'm going to fill up the backend logic so that we refine this where this actually does become a modal form uh, and then it will actually create the objects in the database because right now I'm just creating a dummy object that I'm returning with the test message just to see how it looks for appearance. I need to actually wire that up so that it inserts something in the database, does validations, and takes the screenshots. And I have a whole other video plan for that. So if you like this video and you want to see more me do more live coding, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and be on the lookout for that new video. Give this a thumbs up and I'll see you in the next video.